Well, good evening. Welcome back to our Equip series, Unveiling the Apocalypse. How many of you guys had a great week last week? Yep. Well, we are in for a treat. Dr. Ryan Putman would agree we have a better speaker tonight. I mean, he would he would have said that. He, he would have. And we'll talk. <laughs> uh, we have the incredible privilege to have Dr. Gerald Stevens. Dr. Gerald Stevens is the uh, professor of New Testament and Greek at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. How many how many years have you been teaching? Twenty nine years. Yeah, excellent. So we have a wealth of knowledge uh, with us tonight, and I'm really excited. Um, I never took Dr. Stevens for uh, any classes on on particular books of the Bible. He taught me Greek, and so there are things <laughs> ingrained in my mind that uh, cannot be removed, which is a good thing because I still try to use my Greek as best I can. And so we're really excited to have him tonight. Uh, I want to encourage you to take notes tonight. Uh, this is a book that Dr. Stevens wrote on the book of Revelation. So he's he's the expert, okay? And uh, so I want to encourage you, if you're interested in that book, come and talk to me. I'd love to help you get a copy of it. It's a very readable book, and it's full of information. I've been using it as we've been walking through uh, our series here um, over these past few weeks as well. And so, um, so Dr. Stevens is an expert on Revelation. You've been, how long have you been teaching in the classroom? Okay, so the entire time. I didn't know. So he's been teaching on the book of Revelation for 29 years uh, in, at, at the seminary. He's written uh, this book. He's edited another book, right, of essays on Revelation. And uh, so I'm really excited to have him tonight. We're going to be kind of tackling some of the most, what I consider some of the more difficult content of the book of Revelation tonight, things with the seals and the trumpets and the bowls and some of those issues. And so, like I kind of joked this morning, if I've confused you over the past few weeks, Dr. Stevens is here to bring clarity. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Like last week, we're going to do um, some Q&A at the end. And so I want to encourage you, maybe you've been, as we've been walking through this series, you've come, you know, you've come up with some questions along the way, or maybe tonight as we're walking through content and there's something that Dr. Stevens says that kind of sparks a question, uh, email me that question. You can send your questions to Dustin at vcnola.com, Dustin at vcnola.com. And when we come up at the end, we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A. When we come up at the end, uh, we will walk through some of those questions and and give some answers to those questions, okay? You want to come up? Let me pray for you, and then and then we'll dig in and get started. I want to give you as much time as possible. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you, um, God, for the, um, the gifts that you've given us. In particular tonight, we want to thank you for Dr. Stevens and um, the ways that you have uh, grown his, not just his knowledge for your word, but also his heart and passion for, for your word and his desire to pour into other believers. Um, that they would, especially with a book like Revelation, understand it rightly and apply it in their lives. And so tonight I pray um, for a lot of clarity, and I pray that, uh, God, that he would be able to um, answer questions and help us understand um, why you've given us this book and what it means for us today. And, uh, Father, that, again, like we prayed last week, we wouldn't walk away here tonight just with a ton of new information, but, Father, we would walk away with a message Um, that you've called us to actually live out this week. And so be with us tonight, be in this time, and use it for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have to get my notes going, make sure I'm I'm there. Um, I'm excited to be with you because I have been working with the book of Revelation for a long time. Uh, That is not to say I'm an expert. It means that I am on the journey just like you. Uh, We all have been on a very long journey with the book of Revelation. Uh, If we've had anything to do with trying to understand a very difficult book. Here's what I'm trying to do. Let me give it to you in a nutshell. I'm trying to recanonize the book. I think that a lot of what has happened with the book of Revelation has decanonized it. By that I mean that we've taken it out of the canon. How do you do that? It's real simple. You take the gospel out of it. Anything that's canon has got to have gospel. Anything that's canon has got to be about Jesus. Anything that's canon has got to be what the four gospels are about. 
I am thoroughly convinced that the book of Revelation should have been canonized. I thoroughly regret sometimes, however, that we did because once we canonized it, we then did not exercise ourselves to try to make sure the gospel is in the book. And don't forget that if you hear anything from me that you say, that's not what I've heard before, that actually is a, that's a good thing because I wouldn't want you to hear what you've heard before. Why would you be here? I want you to hear something different. And my students are always cocking their head because they're always, oops, I hadn't heard that before. I haven't heard that before. But the reason why they're cocking their heads and not walking out of the class, but they're staying there is because, and there's something there. I just don't know how you're getting at that. I don't know what you're doing. So in everything that I have to say tonight, <clears throat> and Lord knows, Dustin, you did not do me a favor. I'm trying to talk about the entire judgment cycle. Thank you, brother. <laughs> that, that, that is a formula for failure. I mean, the, the, the judgment cycle is the bulk of the book of Revelation. It's chapter 6 through chapters 20. Uh, there is a series of seals, trumpets, and bowls that are embedded in there. And there's a lot of material. But what I'm trying to do, however, even though we're trying to cover all that, is I'm trying to drive some of the really salient things, the really important things that I think you pull out and these are the things that I think help to recanonize the book, that we bring the gospel back into the book. And I want to show you from the book itself how you can bring the gospel back into the book. So we look at the judgment cycle, and that, that's my target assignment, is this judgment cycle. This judgment cycle uh, deals with chapters 6 through 20. But what I find is the way the book of Revelation is structured is that how John puts together, he gives us a vision that lays a the theological foundation. The reason why John gives you a vision to be a preliminary to the visions is because he's trying to lay a theological foundation. Now, if we don't pay attention to the preliminary vision that is the theological foundation for the following visions, we will miss the point. And so I, I noticed that when John is introducing his various units of his material, you've got an inaugural vision in chapter 1 that's on the Son of Man. Well, now that vision lays the theological foundation for the judgment that follows, which you are familiar perhaps that chapters 2 and 3 are the seven letters to the seven churches. Well, that is where the Son of Man judges the seven churches. And it's the theological information that's in this inaugural vision then that gives us the seven letters and the judgment that is spoken in those seven letters. We call them letters. That's actually not accurate. They are judgment oracles. You got to, in the Greek, it's tare lege. This is what Nathan said to David. Tare lege, thus says. That's what that means. Thus says. And this is when God is really getting ready to get down uh, to the nitty gritty of judgment on his people. Tare lege, Nathan said to David when David uh, had, uh, was trying to get a hold of Bathsheba. And then they had the little parable of the lamb. And then David gets all upset. And, and then Nathan pulls the hammer down and he says, Tare lege. Thus says, well, it's interesting. We don't get that. We call them letters, but they're not like, hey, how are you? Sincerely, Jesus. No, not at all. It's tare lege. Oh, my gosh. I mean, if you, if you were used to reading the Septuagint, you would recognize you're being judged. We call them letters. I don't think they did. They probably call them judgment oracles. Tare lege. That's how they start. Thus says. And you've got the Christ who is the Son of Man, who judges His churches. Well, likewise, we've got another inaug uh, uh, vision that lays a theological foundation. It's a vision of heaven. The chapter division is terrible. There's not a chapter 4 and a chapter 5, really. It's in, in the Greek, it's all one vision. It's a vision of heaven. But they work together, 4 and 5 do. And that vision of heaven is what lays the foundation for what we're interested in, the judgment cycle, uh, which is the judgment of the world. And after the judgment of the world, then we have the final vision that is the victory. This is why I just find it impossible. Dustin asked me, help us with the judgment cycle. And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. 
take a deep breath, Jerry, you can do this, <laughs> you know? And I thought, I cannot do this without at least taking you back through some elements of chapters 4 and 5 because that's the vision that lays the theological foundation for that judgment cycle. So that's what I need to do. And the main picture that you get out of Revelation, one of the, the premier images is a throne. And the interesting thing is John never says God on his throne. He always says the one on the throne. And the reason why he does that is a rhetorical subtlety because that allows you, because you have the one on the throne, you have the rhetorical subtlety of inputting in, in into that the one in your world who rules. Because if you don't say God, your mind could think, well, we don't have kings here in America, but they did in the first century, and you had an emperor, and his name was Domitian. And so when John wrote to the one on the throne, boom, if you lived in the empire of Rome, who would you think of? Domitian. And so John is getting you to, it's very subtle rhetoric, John is getting you to challenge your concept of Domitian's sovereignty because you are thoroughly persuaded Domitian is your Lord, is sovereign over your world, rules your world. And all iconography, that is the, the reliefs in stone that the Roman Empire put up everywhere in the downtowns of their cities, was trying to promote this ideological thing, we rule the world. I mean, that's the grand declaration of the Roman Empire. And their emperors, when they conquer somebody, the statue has the emperor with his foot on the neck of the conquered person, and the conquered person is smaller. They're midget size, and the emperor is huge and colossal. We are the rulers of the world. And that's what their statuary indicated. That's what their iconography indicated. That's what their numismatics, their coins indicated. Rome ruled the world. Rome was sovereign. If you don't live in a society with a Lord that's already on a throne, then how do you know how John's imagery is an attack on your government? It's a subtle attack. John just simply says, to the one on the throne. And you think, your mind, well, you're, you're Domitian, and then, no, wait, this is Christian. That's God. Yeah, there's the struggle. Who is Lord of your life. There's the struggle. Who is Lord of your life? So Revelation 4 and 5 works together. It's a double chapter. You've got Almighty God, chapter 4, and His saving Christ, chapter 5. And in this chapter, you'll notice that in, when you read Revelation 4, you've got three major images. You've got a throne, a sovereign, and a song. And the song gives you all of, the, all of the book of Revelation. Just note this. Every hymn, every song in Revelation is a summary of the basic theology of the book. And the, what the song celebrates is God's sovereignty. And it celebrates that God is the creator. Now, that's a grand statement. If you say that God started something, then who's going to finish it? If God starts something, who's going to finish it? God's going to finish it, not the devil. And that's the sovereignty of God. And that's what's celebrated in that wonderful song in Revelation 4. But then the question is, in our world, how does God manifest His sovereignty? Now, here's where I'm going a little bit. I'm already tracking. I know in my mind I'm already tracking in a direction you may not be familiar with. But watch how this works. The question is, think about it. It's a theological question. Struggle with it. How does God conquer evil? Think about it. How does God conquer evil? And the answer in chapter 5 is with a scroll, a savior, and another song. 
that summarizes that theology. Now, the scroll is the book that cannot be opened unless somebody worthy can be found. And that's the issue that who is worthy to open up this scroll. And then we find that there is a Savior. But the imagery that John uses to show us who is the Savior that can open up the book, the imagery that he uses flips everything on its head. It's not what you expect. And it's not what the church expects today. It is not what we want to hear. I guarantee you. I know that because I know how we live. I know by how we live, we don't want to hear the message of this book. Now, that song then celebrates that victory that God wins through His Christ, through His Messiah. So the issue of four and five, look at the balance here. The question of four is, God is creator. He is sovereign over the world. Grand declaration. But then the question is, how does he manifest his sovereignty? How does he work his sovereignty? How does he express his sovereignty? And we get the answer in chapter 5. He expresses his sovereignty in a most unexpected way. I guarantee you Domitian wouldn't have this answer. Domitian has his answer for how he's going to express his sovereignty. What is his answer? His answer is his mighty legions, of course. I've got legions under my command. I'll send a legion to put down that rebellion. I'll send an army to do this. And that's the imagery that you have in Revelation. But be very careful. Just because there's martial imagery does not mean we have martial theology. Watch out. The imagery is to make a theological point in the world in which sovereignty was expressed by an emperor and his mighty legions, his armies that went out to conquer. But even though that is the context of the imagery, be very careful with that imagery because a martial metaphor does not mean martial theology. Now, watch how this works. That's the question that we've got going on here. And that is, what is really going on with Revelation 4 and 5 together? What's the literary point? And the literary point is going to be the question that's asked in chapter 5. And that is this question. Who is worthy? Well, Domitian, who's going to be worthy to be captain of your praetorian guard? Well, I bet he'll be buff. Hmm? I bet he'll be a soldier. I bet he'll be able to wield a sword. I bet he will be able to face the animals in the arena courageously and triumphantly. Oh, yeah, that would be my praetorian guard. Oh, yeah, I know who I would choose. I I would choose a roaring lion of a man. That's who I would choose. I would choose a roaring lion of a man who could eviscerate you with his claws. Yes, yes, one of my mighty legions. Who wants to be captain of the Praetorian Guard? Who would you choose to express your sovereignty, Domitian? Who does God choose to express his sovereignty? Ah, this is the funny thing the book of Revelation does all the time. John will take traditional Jewish imagery... And what that imagery expected and turn it upside down because of the realities of the way God actually worked when His Messiah came. And that is this imagery that you see in chapter 5. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. That's not as good a translation as I want. The actual word is nikao, from which we get the noun nike, from which we get our shoes, Nike. That's victory, but it means I conquer. So that verb that's translated here as has triumphed, really is has conquered. And that's the question. How does God conquer evil? Roaring lion, yes, strong, yes, yes. So John is told, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. 
Oh, yeah, that's who I expect. <laughs> yeah, just like Domitian and his Praetorian Guard, I expect the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's going to be the one that's going to get out there and win the day, fight the battle, win the day. Oh, yeah, 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 I know who you're talking about. No, you don't. Because immediately after he's told about the lion of the tribe of Judah, what does he see? What does he tell us he sees? And so, I'm told about the lion of the tribe of Judah. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to look at the lion of the tribe. It's a slaughtered lamb. It's a slaughtered lamb. Oh, come on. You're kidding me. You, you are kidding me. That is not the way to win. You have to be kidding me. No, I'm not. Whether you want to hear the message or not, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you've got to know how God conquers evil. And that is through a slaughtered lamb. It's the slaughtered lamb that God conquers. And there is God's miracle. Who would have said on Friday, this is the victory of the world? Which of the disciples danced around the cross and said, yay, yay, this is it. Oh, we got it, we got it. Who danced around the cross saying, oh, there's the victory. Tell me a disciple that was there that danced around shouting, look, world, here's the victory. Not even the disciples who had followed him for years understood how that was a victory. And they all forsook him and fled. And I'm wondering about believers who call themselves believers in Jesus Christ, but when it gets down to the down and dirty, forsake him. And flee the scene of witness. There is the slaughtered lamb. God's victory is this. He does not call us to be able to get out of trouble. He calls us into trouble. Why? Because he is sovereign and he is smarter than you are. And he's smarter than Domitian. Because your mighty praetorian guard in the long run is not going to do the job. And any alternate plan that you have for God. Oh God, I got a better idea. What that? Wait a minute. <laughs> You know, slaughtered lamb, oh, come on, we can do better than that. Slaughtered lamb for conquering evil, come on. I got a better idea. And constantly we're trying to put a better idea into the storyline, our idea. This is how you're going to do it, God. This is how you're going to express your sovereignty in my life. You'll do it this way. This is a better way. And you'll invent your own little praetorian guard to surround you for your sovereignty. But God says, no, that's the way I'm going to do it. And then he gives the miracle. And that's the miracle that we're not expecting. The miracle of resurrection turns Friday, the tragedy of Friday, into celebration. But Jesus had to go through tragedy before he could sing. Hallelujah. And the church will have to go through tragedy before the church can sing hallelujah. There is a storyline here. There is a victory. Nikao conquered, triumphed. Yes, God vindicates his own. But God only vindicates those who have gone to a cross. Only those who live across. I'm sure you probably have heard one of the most famous sayings of Jesus. Take up your cross 
and follow me? It's the way of passion. The passion of Jesus is supposed to be reincarnated in the church. And that is what this is about. And that's how God conquers. In Revelation 5, 6, traditional Jewish messianic imagery, in other words, of the apocalyptic warrior lamb is transformed radically into a unique Passover lamb who dies but lives. In the truth of this Passover imagery, a slaughtered lamb standing resides the heart of Christian faith and practice, the soul of the nature and mission of the church and the hermeneutical key to Revelation's portrait of the eschatological future. This is where it is. If we can get this imagery into our heads, then we can find out the story and the message of the book of Revelation. So, what is the theological point here? Christ fulfills God's sovereignty. Revelation 4 and 5. Christ fulfills God's sovereignty. But it's a passion that fulfills God's sovereignty. So when you are looking for a lion, you need to find a lamb. When you're looking for a lion in Revelation, you need to find a lamb. And that's how you'll recanonize the book. I think it's in this truth. And why would that truth be important? If you are persecuted, you need to know that your death means something to God. Else you won't give your life. You need to have the assurance that if you are called upon, given circumstances, if you're called upon to sacrifice your life on behalf of the gospel, that that is a worthy sacrifice and worthy meaning that is how God wants to do it. How does God want to conquer evil in this world? By your confession. God wants to conquer evil by your confession. We didn't go over the imagery of the Son of Man in chapter 1, but you have had sermon on that, I bet. You've already studied that. What comes out of his mouth? A sword. The only offensive weapon in the book of Revelation comes out of the mouth. What that means is that symbol for the war here is a war of words. It's a war of your confession. It's a war of your witness. You don't understand, but in the very process of witnessing, you are conquering. In the very process of being the church, the passionate church, the church willing to take up a cross. And by the way, that expression, take up your cross and follow me, in the Greek is plural. Translated in southern Greek, take up y'all's cross. It's corporate. This is not an individual cross. This is the cross of the church. It's a corporate cross. Take up y'all's cross. Hey, vintage church, take up y'all's cross. Have you ever seen any of those gory movies about a crucifixion? Come on. That's not a pretty picture. But that's how God does it. So there's this cosmic worship that takes place as a result of this. Because you were slaughtered, you purchased by your blood. So Christ's death is God's victory. Like Paul says, this is nothing different than what Paul says in Philippians 2.8. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Christ opens up God's book. Who is the one worthy to open up the book? Who breaks the seals of the book? It's not the lion but the lamb that breaks the seals of the book. And that's the important thing. The angels agree with this. The angels talk about the slaughtered lamb. Now all of heaven is talking about the slaughtered lamb. If you ask an angel, how does God conquer evil? No angel has any problem with the answer to that pop quiz. The answer to that quiz is God conquers evil through the church. 
through what Jesus released at Calvary. Jesus released a force at Calvary. There's something released into the world that had not been released before. Only the power of the death of Jesus could release this force into the world, this dynamism that changes all human relationships. Abraham couldn't release that force. David couldn't release that force. Isaiah couldn't release that force. But Jesus did release that eschatological, that end time power to change the world. And it has to do with the church. So Jesus is passionate in his witness because he's asking us to buy into the theology. There's your theology. That God conquers evil through passion. There's your theology. And it's tough. And it's hard. But they are the ones that talk about the slaughtered lamb. So the angels agree and they give this sevenfold acclamation. That, and that indicates how perfect this salvation is. Nobody could have thought of this like God did. So all creation joins in in, chapter 13, uh, in verse 13 in chapter 5. And they sing to the one sitting on the throne. Notice how John leaves it ambiguous. To the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb. And there's this crescendo of cosmic worship. What gets heaven a buzz is the cross. Not Armageddon. What gets heaven a buzz is the cross. That's what makes the angels sing. The angels sing because Christ died. That's why the angels sing. That's why heaven rejoices. We need to learn the song of the angels so that we know what to sing when somebody asks us, how does God conquer evil? So who breaks the seals in chapter 6 that starts our judgment cycle? Who breaks the seals? And I would point out to you very carefully, John is very clear. It's the lamb who breaks the seals, not the lion. The lamb breaks the seals. The cross then is the judgment of the world. That's what that tells you. And, but this is nothing other than what the gospels have said. Even John the apostle said when he was talking about the cross of Jesus... Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. Not 2,000 years from now. Jesus didn't say, 2,000 years from now, I'm going to win. 2,000 years from now, the devil is going to be driven out. That is not what he said. He said, now, pointing to himself and his journey up Calvary's hill. John, in other words, in the apocalypse, is not saying anything different than John the Apostle said in the gospel. And so this is how God conquers the world, and that's what the judgment cycle is about. The judgment cycle is about what the cross of Christ released into the world. It released judgment. In what way? In the church's witness, in the church's testimony. In what way? Everything anybody calls sovereign other than God through Jesus Christ is a lie. Every belief system that does not accept Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, the life is a lie. So that your confession is the victory. Because you're the one telling someone who is suggesting an alternate person to sit on the throne of God... You're the one, you're the one, you're the one who says, no, only Jesus. You're the one. And that confession is God's victory over evil. The New Testament says that confession banishes the devil. That confession is your sword. Confession. Confession. So the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls that eventuate come because of a slaughtered lamb, not a lion. And that's the theology that says that this judgment is initiated by Christ's passion and this judgment is cons consummated by the church's passion. And you might say, 
That's an interesting thought. What do you mean consummated by the church's passion? Well, let's reflect on a few things that the Apostle Paul said. Probably verses that I find not too many preachers quoting. Verses that I actually don't find in too many sermons. You go and you do a look, you do a search for these verses in sermons, you'll, it's, you won't get many hits, Dustin. And I know why. For I carry the marks of Jesus branded in my body. When Paul said, take up a cross, I mean, when Jesus said, take up a cross, Paul took him literally. I've got the brand marks of Jesus. What would that be? The marks of the cross. That would be nails in the palms. That would be nails in the ankles. That would be a spear in the side. That would be a crown of thorns on the head. The brand marks of Jesus I carry in my body. And then Paul said something else that's incredible in Colossians 1.24. In my flesh, I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus said, to tell us thy, it is finished on the cross. I thought that does it all. That it, that there's nothing that I do. Yet Paul says something here that expresses a reality that I don't think the church has bought into or understood. Especially this expression, completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What is lacking? Not what is insufficient. Oh, you mean like the cross doesn't save? Not at all. It's not what Paul is saying. But he does say that those afflictions are not consummated. How do they get consummated? In the church. So part of the mission of the church is to consummate the afflictions of Christ. Which ties in, dovetails perfectly with Jesus' own command to his disciples. Take up y'all's cross and follow me. It ties in together. So... I have what I call a passion millennial approach to, my, uh, to the book of Revelation. I, I'm not pre, I'm not post, I'm not all millennial. I'm passion millennial. I'm trying to get the passion back into the story. If we don't get the passion back into the story, we never should have canonized the book. Because it's passion that makes anything New Testament. So we've got to think about how to get this passion back into the church. So if you think about God being sovereign, somebody sitting on a sovereign chair, you must think about a crown of thorns. Those go together. That's Revelation 4 and 5. You can't think of one without thinking of the other. So who is worthy? The one who wears a crown of thorns. That's who's worthy. So what's worthy in the life of the church? The church that carries a crown. Of thorns, completing the afflictions of Christ. That's the vision then. I had to go through that to set up the judgment cycle because that's what starts the judgment cycle. The judgment cycle then, 6 through 20, is going to consummate <clears throat> this, ju excuse me, this judgment that's released. So you have the hermeneutical issues of how do you take the prophecies in Revelation. There are these four major theories. I suppose, Dustin, you've gone through these theories. Some a little bit. Ideal theory is that the, the fulfillment of whatever's prophetic in Revelation is all the time. It, it, this is just like an eight-track tape. It just runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. The preterist view is that it's all past. The historicist view is dividing up any history that you have lived up to your point in time and saying that, that prophecy is about that, that prophecy is about that, and you just divide up history. And that's a historicist. And then the futurist is saying, no, 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 no. All of Revelation is all about the future. None of it has transpired. That's all about the future. And so basically, in my take on it, you need to understand I'm preterist, but not fully. I'm not a complete preterist. In other words, here's what I think. Preterist position is a way of saying what we know about any book when we're trying to do exegesis of any book and we're trying to interpret any book in the New Testament. For example, say I gave you the job of 
teaching a Sunday school lesson on 1 Corinthians, a passage in 1 Corinthians, well, what would you do? Well, instantly, you would start trying to set this up. You would start studying, well, how did that church get started? Uh, who started it? Oh, Paul. Oh, okay. What, what missionary journey? Second missionary journey. Oh, okay. And on and on you go. You build a history around it. In other words, you know that the interpretation of 1 Corinthians is the history that's built around 1 Corinthians. Preterist position on Revelation is simply saying that the main address of the book is not to an audience 2,000 years later, but to the original audience, just like you would with 1 Corinthians. You'd say, who was 1 Corinthians written for? Well, the, the Corinthians, obviously. Well, who was Revelation written for? The seven churches. Obviously. That's who's addressed at the very beginning of the church. Here's the point. Once you leave chapter 3, you don't leave the seven churches. My position is that all of Revelation up through chapter 20, that's this whole judgment cycle, is about the seven churches. And that is not a common position. I'm not a pure preterist. A pure preterist would say everything in Revelation already has been fulfilled. That's pure past position on the prophecy. I'm not a pure preterist. But I would insist, according to main guidelines of good interpretation, that the main audience addressed is the original audience. And the main meaning of any text is the original audience. And that gives you the substance of why I would say, when I say I'm preterist, I'm just simply saying Revelation is about the seven churches. And so in terms of prophecy and prophecy fulfillment, that's basically how I would go. The other question about this judgment cycle and all these judgments is you have three major theories. You got seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven times, three times, seven is 21. So you got imaged 21 judgments. So is that 21 sequential judgments or does the seventh judgment play out into the next series because the seventh judgment when you read it is really not a judgment at all? Or is it recapitulation? Well, I have reasons for thinking that probably what we are dealing with here is recapitulation. Uh, there are, are some elements to this. Repentance is sought every time. So there's this continuing drive for repentance in all three cycles of the seals, the trumpets, and the bowl. Also, if you look at the percentage of destruction in the seals, it's 25%. In the trumpets, it's 33%. In the bowls, it's 100%. So the progression, there's a progression of the destruction. That indicates recapitulation. And then in every seal and trumpet, at the end of the seals and the end of the trumpets, they're non-conclusive. They don't actually end. They flow out into the next. So I, I pretty much think that seals, trumpets, and bowls are recapitulating the same truths. And John, why would you do that? Well, why would you sing multiple verses to a song? So that you can come back to the chorus. And so John recapitulates these series of judgments so that he can emphasize dramatically what is taking place. And I think that in this repeating series that you have the seals, then the trumpets, and then the bowls. That's the judgment cycle that we've been talking about, seals, trumpets, and bowls. And so what we are, want to look at is, first of all, the seals and the trumpets. And immediately when you look at this series of seals and trumpets through this great judgment cycle, the first thing that you notice is an unusual structure. And that is that the seals and trumpets are structured the same. That is, when you go through the first four, it's one verse after the other. Verse one is, is seal one. Verse two is seal two and so on and so forth. Boom, 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 boom. And you get the first four. Then you have five, and then you have six. Now, six always is the end in the seals and the trumpets. When you read six, you feel like you're at the end. But what's funny is, after the end, you get an interlude, and then you get number seven, which is not really a judgment. Now, the trumpets are structured the same way. The first four trumpets, boom, 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 boom. One, two, three, four. Then there's five, then there's six. Trumpet six looks like the end. The cosmic disturbances things going on it looks like the end but it's not the end and so uh then you have this interlude and then trumpet seven <clears throat> here's my point look at that structure there's an interlude to each series it's the interlude that's important 
that's why the interlude. You know how when you're watching a movie, you got it on the DVD player, and uh, you know it's 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 like, oh man, I, I need to take a break. Punch pause, so that you can take a break. Well, in the judgment cycle, John punches pause on the DVD player, so that he can remind the listeners of the truths that he wants to get across. And so the interlude here are giving truths that he wants to bring across in each one of these series. So you've got this judgment cycle. Here's another way to look at it. The first half of Revelation is the Christ cycle, talking about Almighty God and His Christ, and this is the seals and the trumpets. And then you have the second half of Revelation is the dragon cycle, which is introducing a, a very new character, the red dragon and his beast. These are new characters. So it's kind of like Act 2. So the Christ cycle is like Act 1. The dragon cycle is like Act 2 because you've got different characters on board. And so John is moving the series along, and he's going to recrank it at chapter 12 and re Hearse the issues of the seals and the trumpets. So as we, whoops, I did the wrong thing. So would you pump that up again on that slide? <coughs> Let's see if we. So when when you are when you are looking at this uh, material, what what's obvious is the first two have a, the similar structure, and they all they both go to an interlude that's very important, and then the third recranks the story but makes it very particular to the seven churches in their dealing with Domitian and the Roman Empire. So we want to look at the seals and uh, in, the, in the seal judgment. Let's see if this will work. Here we go. What is John telling us? The, uh, Reddish uh, says in his commentary, John is telling the prospective martyrs that their deaths are a necessary part of God's plan for conquering evil. John has already made clear that God's victory over evil has been accomplished by the death of the Lamb. Now he shows that the deaths of the faithful also contribute to that victory. And that's going to be the message of these interludes that we get into as we are looking at this repeating series here that John is working on in these interludes. So the thing that's important about the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, especially in the seals and the trumpets, is to look at how he's going to take the seals, and I'm not sure what's going on there. Take it again. Thank you. Um, to look at what uh, he's uh, actually accomplishing uh, here in uh, this particular part of the material. When we look at the uh, interlude uh, for the um, seals, the interlude for the seals is the 144,000 and the great multitude. Once again, John does the same thing he always does. He takes Jewish imagery, the 12 tribes, and then he baptizes it unto Christ. Just like he took Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jewish imagery, and then he baptized it unto Christ. And he turned around to see the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and what he sees is a slaughtered lamb. And so this is what he does with the 144,000. This is God's people protected. They got the seal of God. It's God's people protected. Well, how does that translate in Christian terms into the great multitude? God's people protected are all of those faithful witnesses of the gospel throughout time. And that's the great multitude in heaven. And that is what John wants to tell us, is that the way God works is through tribulation, not out of tribulation. God works through tribulation. And that's what the seals are telling us with the 144,000 that are sealed. But even though they might have to give up their lives, you say, well, God protected me. If I get killed, how did God protect me? Because for a believer, a believer's death is never the period on their life. Not when God is sovereign. It's only a comma. So when a believer dies, God is the one who's still in control and through resurrection vindicates and validates that believer's testimony. Well, the trumpets have an interlude in order for John to transition into the rest of the sealed judgments. And that uh, interlude uh, is about a scroll that John himself has to eat and it's sweet and then it's bitter. This is that prophetic commission. And John is told that he's got to prophesy again and that's what he's going to do. So you'll notice that in each of these series, what's going on is that God is still through the witness of the church trying to get the world to repent. 
repentance theme is throughout these uh, series here because in the trumpets, you'll notice the rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. There's that theme of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their fornication or their thefts. And so this uh, repentance theme also is uh, picked up in the seals, as well, I mean in the bowls, excuse me. You'll notice the, in the bowls you have this statement. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him the glory and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. Here's the point. When you're going for repentance... The judgment is not punitive. If there is a repentance theme in these judgment cycle, bowls, uh, trumpets and bowls, if there's a repentance theme, the judgment is not punitive. It's not a penalty for a crime after which you're thrown in jail. The judgments are like the guard at the beach, the lifeguard at the beach, swimming out and the person flailing in the water and you have to slap them across the face and knock them silly in order to help them, to keep them from drowning, to get them back to shore. The judgments, whatever they are, need to be conceptualized as God trying to get the attention of someone you're witnessing to. God trying to make sure that that heart is prepared to hear the word of the gospel. And so the judgments have the intent of repentance. Well, you can only repent if you have the opportunity to hear the gospel. So the church has to be active and alive in their witnessing if the repentance is indicated here in the judgment series. And so you've got the literary structure showing you in this last interlude that there's going to be another judgment cycle to come because in this cycle, John is told that he needs to prophesy again. That means that John is telling us after 11 chapters of the book of Revelation, I'm not done. And you're saying, well, I am. I'm tired. <laughs> you know, I'm finished. You know, uh, you've already confused me enough, John. I'm not done. I was told to prophesy again. So I'm going to recrank the whole storyline. And that's why he introduces brand new characters in chapter 12. A red dragon we've never seen before. A beast out of the sea and a beast out of the earth that we've never seen before. Why is he, why is he recranking the imagery in different ways? Because he was told to prophesy again. And so he does. And that's why the storyline changes. Even though we're still in the judgment cycle, he's going to introduce new characters into this. Another important thing in this last interlude of the trumpets here is we have the statement in 1118, Your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and to destroy those who destroy the earth. The time for the dead to be judged. There's only one place in the book of Revelation where that's true. When are the dead judged? You know, what's the imagery? You know that it's the blank, blank throne, the great white throne. Yeah, everybody knows that. That's when the dead are judged. So what John is telling you is that this new series I'm cranking up is going to eventuate to show you the paradigm of how it's going to be when we get to the great white throne. And that's what he's telling us. That's when God's wrath comes is this playing out of the bowls is the, the last uh, series here. It's the last because in Revelation 8, 11, 18, your wrath came. What this means is that God judges all empires that claim sovereignty. God judges every empire that claims sovereignty. I'm wondering, did you ever have world civilization classes in college or something like that? Uh, you know, you just, you go through it. It's one empire after another one, right? You got the Assyrian Empire, and you got the Babylonian Empire, and you got the Greek Empire, and you got the Roman Empire. Which one of them still stands? Not a one. Not one. Which throne is the only throne that once occupied is never vacated? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how God expresses his sovereignty. 
He will not let any claim to sovereignty stand. And by various means at his control, he will bring down every pretension to sovereignty in his own ways. So God judges, even in this world, God judges. And he judged Rome for what Rome was doing. He brought Rome down, and he will bring every empire down. Now, in terms of the thematic parts that we are looking at here, you'll notice that we now are already moving toward the bowls. I'm already trying to get to the bowls. I've only picked high points out of the seals and trumpets to show you some of the themes. God protects his own. He expects witness. God expects John to re-prophesy, to re-crank. And so the bowls are going to be something different. They're going to look different. They're not going to have the same structure as the first part of Revelation. And that's exactly what we meet. We meet this red dragon who, through his beast, is going to attack the church. And this is that, that storyline that starts in chapter 12. This storyline is about cosmic conflict, messianic conquest, and a scatological climax. And that gets us all the way through chapter 20. Here's the deal. What does John want to retell the churches in Asia Minor? He's already told them, be faithful. He's already told them, you will be persecuted. He's already told them, that is how God conquers evil, is through your passion. He's already told them this. So what do we need to understand about this storyline? Am I really fighting Domitian, the emperor? And the answer is, no, not really. Who you're really fighting is the red dragon. And that is why no matter how many times you kill that emperor, he is resurrected in some later figure in history. Because the war is not earthly. The battle is cosmic. And so it's a cosmic conflict. That's why John introduces a red dragon. <coughs> Pardon me. A red dragon is someone who is, uh, is a figure in the ancient world. Everybody knew about a red dragon. Everybody had dragon stories. All the great civilizations had dragon stories. So John's pulling off of storylines that have been told for millennia about how this world operates. All these stories are trying to say why we have the problems we have. And so this is the nature of calling upon this cosmic conflict. But in this cosmic conflict, there is a messianic conquest. And finally, we get to an eschatological climax, which will be Satan's defeat and God's judgment. Evil is never truly uh, defeated until Satan is defeated. And then you have God's judgment that issues. Now, this messianic conquest is where I'm reading Revelation different than the way you probably have heard. I, I know if you've heard some interpreters of Revelation, they will insist that beginning at chapter 4, all the rest of Revelation is completely future. I know because I used to think that. I, I grew up on that. And so I always thought that from Revelation 4 on, it's all about the future. I'm turning that on its head. I am saying that you don't get to the future in Revelation to the end of chapter 20 till you get to the Gog and Magog battle. Well, what do you do with Armageddon? That's in chapter 16. What do you do with the rider on the white horse? That's in chapter 19. You mean that's not the second coming? No, that's where I'm turning things on their head. Let me show you just a little bit to give you just a hint of how this works for me in terms of trying to understand how this thing is brought to a conclusion by John. And that is what you... When we're looking for the uh, martyr song, it's interrupted with the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Moses is described like a servant, just like John. And God is described versus the imperial claims. The way the stuff starts reading in chapter 15 shows you how God is being presented as the uh, anti-emperor to Domitian. You got the Pantocrator, that is the all-powerful, which is God, versus the Autocrator, which is the Domitian. All imperial inscriptions. When you are looking for the word emperor on an imperial inscription in Greek, you would look for the word autokrator, the self-powerful. Auto, like automatic, the self-powerful. 
Krator, Krateo, strength, I am strong. Autokrator, the self-powerful one. Well, Domitian claimed to be the self-powerful one. And God is the all-powerful one. He's the true sovereign. And so you get this song of Moses and the song of the Lamb mixed together. The great redemption out of the Old Testament used as imagery for the redemption of the New Testament. So you have the king of the nations versus the Roman Empire. God is king, not Rome. All the nations will come and worship versus the Roman beast. So you have John using the Exodus in the bowl series as a paradigm of the redemption. So the bowl judgments are enacted, but then you get bowl six. And here's where I want to spend just a little bit of time in bowl six, just to show you something that happens. In bowl six, uh, after bowl six, you get three additional pieces of imagery. You don't get bowl seven, in other words. You've got a short little period here, of a few verses, 13, 14, 15, and 16. You get the frogs in 13 and 14. You get a beatitude in 16, 15, and you get Armageddon. Ooh, there we are. We're finally there. Armageddon, we're there. Okay, I finally got there. Uh, so let's look at this, though. I mean, the frogs, they they come out of the... I don't know why I'm doing that. Could you hit that again for me? I don't know what's going on. But when, when you get the, uh, the frogs, what's happening uh, there is that the, the frogs... Notice where the frogs come from. The, the statement is very clear that the frogs come out of the mouth. So where do these demons come from? Out of the mouth. That is, once again, the imagery is about what you say. The imagery is about your confession. Just like the sword comes out of the mouth of the Son of Man, the demons, the foul demons, the foul spirits come out of the mouth. That which denies Christ His sovereignty comes out of the mouth. It's a confession that is made, and that's why you have the frogs. But then you get this benediction. What you need to notice about this benediction is that the benediction is one verse before the verse on Armageddon. No Nobody reads the benediction. That's a problem. Because John uses the benediction to give you an interpretation of Armageddon. Watch how this works. And what he's going to do is he's going to tie back to the seven letters. So here you have the seven letters, specifically the letters to Sardis and Laodicea. And you have that famous Armageddon here in chapter 16. But notice in the benediction, which is verse 15, see, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. And then the verse, here's verse 16, then the verse, after the benediction, then the verse, and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. The benediction is the prelude to the imagery of Armageddon, and the benediction takes you back to the seven letters. Because if you'll notice in the seven letters, those two themes, did you notice the two themes in the benediction? You had the theme of, I'm coming like a thief. Be awake, I'm coming like a thief. And the second theme you had, the second motif was the shame of nakedness. Now notice that. You get this theme of waking up or else Christ comes like a thief in the letter to Sardis. Within the book of Revelation itself, John uses the benediction to take you back to the letter to Sardis. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I come upon you. Look at that motif. I will come like a thief. There's only two times in the book of Revelation where you have the motif of coming like a thief. The letter to Sardis and right before Armageddon. They're hooked together by John. And then notice the statement to Laodicea. In the statement to Laodicea, you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and what? And naked. Buy from me white robes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen. The only two times nakedness is a motif in the book of Revelation are in the letter to Laodicea and in the benediction right before the statement about Armageddon. 
I am telling you that Armageddon is not a battle God is going to fight. Armageddon already has been fought. We call it Calvary. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the devil cast out. That is what Armageddon is about. Because John himself has made the connection for us. Armageddon is about what the seven churches were having to deal with. Armageddon is about the realities at Sardis. Armageddon is about the realities at Laodicea. Now this is even more clear after you see this connection of the benediction to the statement about Armageddon in knowing that Armageddon has no real geography. I don't care what you have been told. I'm telling you there is no mountain of Megiddo in Israel. There is no mountain of Megiddo. There is no mountain to be found on any map. The etymology of this word even is unclear. We don't have any etymology for the word that John uses. He cranks out a word. We don't even know what it is. Ancient Megiddo is just a town. It's just a city. It sits in the Jezreel Valley. Now, over years of occupation, you have occupation layers that, layers that have built the town up. But the town is just a hill. And there is no Jew that ever used the expression mountain of Megiddo, either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament or since, which simply means there is no mountain of Megiddo. That means that the Mount of Megiddo is of unknown meaning, simply meaning John meant it to be that way. We're the ones that made it concrete, like it had meaning. He's trying to keep it ambiguous so that you know this battle is fought wherever confession is challenged, like at Sardis or Laodicea or Vineyard Church. What if Armageddon is being fought now in your confession? And that is how God conquers evil. So, even with Armageddon, I am uh, working at this. And you'll notice how at the end of the bowls, we're going to expand out. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. So, now we're going to have the story of Babylon to reinforce the story of the bowls. Then you have the seventh plague, and these are applied further uh, to room uh, in the interpretation. So the bold judgments then go into the bold perspectives of Babylon and those who have various perspectives on this judgment of God. So once we have the messianic conquest, we see how the Messiah is going to rule. And here is what I think John would conclude with, and that is, and the Lord, the God of their father, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until there was no remedy. That's the bowls. Where God says enough is enough. But he's going to do it through the church. So I would say that in this entire judgment cycle. The main thing that you, we have to be careful to try to do. I may not have been successful in persuading you of my viewpoint. But I at least want you to think about. How John actually has written the material. And to ask the question. Is your interpretation of Revelation really canonical? Does it really take you to the cross? And I would just simply submit that in most interpretations, we all want to know about Armageddon and nobody cares about the cross. And I think that defeats the purpose that John had. So, thank you very much.
I just want to say, I've been saying all of that for several weeks now. Have you? I have, and they, they look less confused. So I'm just saying. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, none of you sent any questions, which is unacceptable. So start <laughs> sending your questions in um, so we can talk about stuff. I know most of you are kind of just sitting there. Uh, how many of you are able to take thorough notes? One person, yeah, maybe two. I couldn't take thorough notes in your class. I mean, I just had to keep up, you know. Um, <laughs> you gave me chapter 6 through 20. <laughs> uh, you succeeded, though, I think. So you did exactly what I wanted you to, to, to do tonight. Um, let me look at my phone real quick just to make sure none came in. And if none came in yet, then we can... Uh, we'll go live. We'll go live. No questions yet. So I'll give them a few minutes to send some questions in. Um, was there anything that you kind of felt rushed in? I mean, I know everything, but <laughs> is there anything that... That's a bad way to start, I, Dustin, is. rephrase. <laughs> is there anything that uh, you briefly touched on that you feel like you might want to go a little more deeper in that you might want to touch on for a few minutes? It's, it's a great way to start, but let me defer to the audience. Here's the deal. Uh, we, ha we had to cover 6 through 20. That's a that's, that's the bulk of Revelation. And so what I'm worried about is that you, even though you didn't send in a question, that you're actually, you've got a burning question in your head, and for whatever reason, you just don't want to ask it. And, and I, I, just, I just want you to ask mm -hmm. it. I would do better if I could get an actual question. That would give me traction. Okay. I'd know, I know where the thinking is because, yeah, things I'm worried about but might not have a thing to do with what you guys are thinking. So... Let me defer it. Well, is anybody not sent a question in that has one that just wants to ask one? Just, just ask. This is yes, dangerous, yes, but we're going to do it. Did you get that? No, if I didn't. Armageddon's did. already happened. So what, what she was asking... Then correct me if I'm wrong. If if Armageddon's already happened, what about the seals, trumpets, and bowls? Yeah, see there, that's a great question. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, I said Armageddon has already happened. And by that, what I mean is the church and struggle in witness is participating in God conquering the world. That is Armageddon. Here's what I think is happening. Here's a, here's a way to address that question, I think. Uh, then what is Revelation about? If the bulk of Revelation is about the seven churches, what is, re what is Revelation about? Well, the seven churches. But then why was John inspired to write? Because here, here's what I think he perceived. Through the Holy Spirit, I think the Holy Spirit helped John to recognize that the troubles that he was dealing with in trying to have a Christian testimony in Asia Minor in AD 93, 94, 95, somewhere in there, with Domitian as emperor and with the ideology of the Roman Empire, trying to have a Christian testimony in that context eventuated in persecution. I mean, we already have one martyr in Revelation. And that's in the letter to the church at Pergamum. His name is Antipas, and he has died for the faith. I think the book of Revelation is about Antipas. The questions that Antipas' death might raise for a believer, for a believer in Sardis or a believer in Laodicea or elsewhere. And John answered that question that God was going to conquer evil through our faithful witness. Antipas will be vindicated. His witness will be validated. And that, uh, that is in God's timing how he's going to do that. But then what, what the Holy Spirit helped John to see was, you know how you have a, when you're making a dress, you need a pattern, and you, you cut your material on the basis of the pattern that you're seeing. That's how you know how to make the dress. In the same way, how, how do we know what the end looks like? And John is saying, you know, the Holy Spirit has inspired me to write because the end is going to look like the seven churches and Domitian and the Roman Empire. It's going to look like this, where one person controls the economy, the government, the military, 
And life is not possible without sleeping with the enemy, so to speak. Life is not possible. You cannot live in the Roman Empire without submitting to the Roman ideology. Uh, even we, we think, it's hard for us to think about living in an empire world. We don't. So it's hard for us to understand that if you don't pinch incense to Caesar, you don't have a job. That's what trade guilds were in the first century. Trade guilds were associations of artisans who had particular skills. And whether you were a coppersmith or you were a, a, a bread maker or whatever you were doing, you had to belong to a guild. The guild belonged to Domitian. And the guild had monthly meetings. And you had to show your... Um, your faithfulness to the empire by attending the monthly meeting. And that required pinching incense to the bust of Caesar as you went into the building. That required doing sacrifices that were required as a part of that guild meeting that month. If you did not participate in that, you couldn't be a member of the guild. If you couldn't be a member of the guild, you were not allowed to set up your coppersmith shop downtown. So, to be a faithful Christian, you might not have a job. That kind of economic pressure was huge in the first century. John is saying, there's your pattern. What does it look like when the end comes? When the end comes, the church will be under huge duress, huge persecution. So, Armageddon is always going on, but it's not consummated until that last walk up Calvary's Hill. Just like in the ministry of Jesus, he was fighting the demons and the devil all the time. So the battle was going on every day that Jesus lived. And the battle is going on every day the church lives. But the battle does not come to its end until that climatic hill of Calvary. And that's where the battle comes to its climax. And John is saying... The church will be going through persecution, but it will come to a climax. The persecuted church in the world is the ongoing story of the church, but it comes to a climax. That climax is Gog and Magog at the end of the book of Revelation. And until the church goes through its passion, the passion of Jesus is not consummated. And so I think, it, in other words, it's true now but ever more true then. So Armageddon is going on in every fight for confession, just like Jesus was fighting the demons all during his ministry. But the consummation, the, the end of it, is not until that great final struggle that the church will have, like Jesus. We've got a couple of questions now, but I want, I think, I want to ask you kind of a follow-up question to that uh -huh. that I think will help clarify for, for people. So when you when we talk about the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, um, the, it, the imagery is figurative, right? Yeah. And so is it literally that the people are going to experience every single one of these things, like the sun's going to turn, you know, dark and the people are going to have sores? That's not the point of the, the images. W I mean, would you say that the, the point is the judgment that's coming and the judgment, you were talking about the recapitulation of the judgment cycles, that it's going to increase and it's going to get worse. So it's not, it's not, a lot of the futurists are going to interpret Revelation, like we need to be looking for these things and the sun's going to turn dark and sores mm -hmm. are coming. It's not that, but it's instead to see where the imagery is, what the imagery is teaching us about the intensity of the judgment that is coming. Would, right. Is yes. that? Yeah. But don't forget uh, let me give you a for example. In the seals, the, f the first four seals are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, a very famous uh, concept, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But if you look at what the four horsemen are, they are basically uh, war and the impact of war. And that is a statement of the major way that Rome conquered others through war, through conquest. And when you have war and conquest, what do you have? You have famine. When you have famine, what do you have? Disease and pestilence. So the things that, that play out when human beings have their way on the world, 
the things that play out are the judgment of God. Because God is not going to let that way of sovereignty endure. And so he will make sure that we, we just experience death all of the time. This conquest is nothing but the destroyer destroying the earth. And so the, what happens in the seals and the trumpets and the bowls are those forces within history that take place because God has set up the world in that way such that if you have war, there's going to be death. If you have war and death, there's going to be famine. If you have famine, there's going to be pestilence. So the sores are coming out of the real experience of real people who actually experience the Roman Empire. Some of that imagery, a Jew would understand that imagery. A Jew who went through the destruction of Jerusalem in the first Jewish war would understand that's what Rome does because when Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, by the Roman army, Jerusalem famished, and when they famished, they went into pestilence and sores, and they even went to cannibalism. Josephus, the historian, tells us stories of cannibalism in Jerusalem because of the conquest of the Roman Empire over Judah. So the forces that we see let loose in each of these judgments are not forces that we don't know about, and we don't have to wait for the future for these forces to be unleashed. If you make war, there will be death. If there is death, there will be famine. If there is famine, there will be pestilence, God has declared. He doesn't let it go any other way. And so we don't have to wait for the future for the actual images of what's revealed in the seals, trumpets, and bowls actually to play out. Now, what about cosmic disturbances? This is a good point. Here, here's, this is very important. In terms of cosmic disturbances, those always are a picture of the end, the end, the end, the end. The cosmic disturbances, John puts into the sixth in each series, the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet. But then he follows afterwards, which tells you that I'm bringing you up to the end, but I am not giving you the end. Because there is something else that follows after. I mean, if we're at the end, you're at the end, right? The movie, when you get the script goes by and it says the end, you, you'll get up and walk out. So the cosmic disturbances were well-known images that apocalyptic writers used to talk about the end in terms of capital T and capital E, the end. But when John does that, he actually innovates in that he doesn't let the end actually be the end. And then he, he transitions into another series because why? He wants to recapitulate for the impact, a quarter, a third, more. It gets more and more for dramatic impact. So even with the cosmic disturbances, should we be looking for the sun to turn red? No. What does the sun look like when your city is burning? Red. Have you ever seen the sun through smoke? It's red. All you need is a conquest of a city to understand that imagery. It means you have been destroyed. It means you have been conquered. You, you don't have to look for something in the future. All of this imagery comes out of the real experiences of people in the first century world. It made sense to them. It wasn't weird. It wasn't wild. It's the Roman legions are out there battering our walls down. And when they get in, they're going to burn us to the ground. And when they do, the smoke will go up forever. Did you know that a city that burns once it's been conquered uh, cannot even be occupied again because of the heat for months and months and months? And the smoke of its burning just goes up almost interminably. There are stories in Josephus where a destroyed city was still smoking six months later. So this is just what you see in the judgments you don't have to look into the future to see them. It's 628, but I have a question that somebody's asked that I really want to okay. ask. Go so if you guys feel like you need to leave, feel free to leave, but it's going to be a good one. Oh, I'll give you a quick one. <clears throat> you didn't talk about the rapture at all. Oh, that's easy. Oh, uh, We can do that in 10 seconds. So maybe do this. Define for people, define what is the rapture or how do people understand the okay. rapture? and uh, what you believe about it sure. in the book of Revelation. Rapture is a doctrine invented by Jay and Darby uh, in the dispensational system of the 1800s. There was no rapture doctrine before then. 
In other words, it's a new invention of a new kind of eschatology, a new kind of es uh, last things. The idea is that God is going to take the church out of the world, and that's when we get the seven-year period of great tribulation that everybody else goes through, but the church doesn't. The reason why I do not believe in the rapture is that the rapture just completely destroys the cross. I don't believe in the rapture because if the church does not take up her cross, God does not conquer evil. So I would say the opposite of what a dispensationalist would say. I would say the church must go through tribulation just like, now think about this, when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, did God rapture him out? No. God will not rapture the church out of her passion, just like he did not rapture Jesus out of his passion. I'd say that's a pretty good answer. Uh, I want to, number one, can we thank Dr. Stevens again? Uh, so I want to remind you that we've got two more weeks left of this. Um, next week, Dr. Ryan Putman will be back, and he's going to be talking about resurrection, the topic of resurrection, the topic of uh, the millennium, and uh, post-millennium, pre-millennialism, amillennialism, passion millennialism. I'll make sure he talks it. about it. <laughs> uh, and then if not, we'll bring you back your, back the last week, and you can share uh, your opinion. And then um, the week following that, in two weeks, Dr. Stevens will be back, and he's going to be spending a lot of time at the very end of Revelation uh, 21, 22, talking about the new heavens and new earth and what that means for us. And so I really want to encourage you uh, to be here for these last two uh, meetings. Also, be thinking about your questions now because we have time, and I want to be able to answer them. And uh, I know you're drinking from a fire hydrant, and it's a lot, but uh, I want to thank you for being here. And I just want you to... I just want you to kind of sit on this and think about this uh, this week. One of the things that I love about what Dr. Stevens brings to the book of Revelation is it's not crazy talk, right? I mean, you did have charts. <laughs> I'm sorry. You did have charts, but it's not, <clears throat> it's not crazy talk, right? He makes sense of it, and what I love about what he talks about is the importance of our witness and the significance of, that uh, of that that we have that God has called us to be faithful regardless of what comes and that just, just think about this for this week okay when you share Jesus when you talk about Jesus you're pushing back darkness just think about that if you're not you're not pushing back darkness God wants to use you to defeat Evil. He wants to use Vintage Church to defeat evil. And what that means for us and what it means from the book of Revelation is that God has called us to be a faithful witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, I can promise you, has practical implications for each one of our lives this week. And so this week, let's go with that, with that reminder that we've been called to be faithful witnesses. And that as we do, God's using us and using us together to push back darkness, not here in this city, but all around the world, okay? Let's pray, and then uh, we'll leave. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you for bringing revelation to life, not just that we would just understand it, Father, but that we would go out and actually live it. And so empower this week, empower us this week, Father, um, that we would be faithful witnesses, God, that as we say here at Vintage, that we would um, leave this place and live the gospel, serve the city, and be the church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great night.